So, I entitled this a definitive description of the Prophet Muhammad uh, in the Bible. Uh, before we get to the so-called definitive uh, prophecy, just to uh, set the table, uh, as it were, uh, with some hadith and some ayat of the Quran, the Prophet وسلم, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, Innani asma'an, I have many names, Ana Muhammad wa ana Ahmad. I have many names. I am Muhammad, I am Ahmad, I am Al Mahi, through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obliterates unbelief. I am Al Hashir, at whose feet humanity will be gathered, and I am Al Aqib after whom there will be none. And of course, there are many, many names, beautiful names of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shaykh Yusuf al-Nabahani, Rahimahullah, Nabahani, Rahimahullah, he mentions in his book, Fadah al-Nabi wa Ummati, over 99 names of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In reality, there are hundreds of names. Of course, the names of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala are infinite. But this is just one uh, well-known hadith. So if you look at these names, so Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is his uh, name that most people know him. This is a passive participle. It means the one who is constantly praised. One time, a non-Muslim asked me, "What does the name Muhammad mean?" Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and I said, "It means the most praised." And he was surprised, and he said, "Was he born with this name?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Don't you think that's kind of amazing?" And I thought about it. I said, "Yeah, that is kind of amazing. The name itself is a fulfillment of prophecy." So it's a passive participle of the form to in Arabic, which is something that denotes repetitive or intensive action. The one who is repetitively and intensively praised. He is also Ahmad, which is a superlative, ism taqdeel, the most praised of all creation. And by the way, according to uh, our hagiography, the sacred biography of the Prophet ﷺ, our uh, liege lady Amna bint Wab, anha, when she was pregnant with the Prophet ﷺ, she had a dream and she heard a voice, and the voice said that you have Sayyidul Qawm, you have the master of the people within you. When he is born, seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and call him or name him Muhammad. And the tradition continues, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that his name is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran, and his name is Ahmad in the Torah and in the Injil. The most praise of creation upon the tongue of our master Isa alayhi salam wa mubashiran bi rasooli ya'di min ba'di ismuhu Ahmad that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that Isa alayhi salam Jesus peace be upon him he said I'm giving you glad tidings which is bushra which is what the word gospel means Injil means good news good news of a messenger to come after me his name is Ahmad the most praised and the ulama also mentioned that the name of the Prophet وسلم, on the Yom Al-Qiyamah is Ahmad Al-Mahi, active participle, the one who effaces kufr or shirk. The Prophet وسلم, is the greatest monotheist in the history of humanity. The greatest monotheist. And Jewish scholars find him a bit of an enigma because their whole claim to fame is that they brought Tawheed to the world. This is their claim. We brought Tawheed and it's our responsibility, it's our duty to bring Tawheed to the nations. But this one man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did more for the spreading of Tawheed than all of the Israelite prophets put together. So they recognize that. There's something special about this man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Al-Hashir, the one who gathers as we read in the Biya al uh, Shaykh Al-Habib Umar bin Hafiz, may Allah preserve him, it's Anta fil Hashri Maladun, Laka Kulu al Khalqi Tafza'. That you are the refuge on the day of gathering, and all of humanity will go to you. Right? So all of humanity will go to different prophets, and they'll say, Nafsi, Nafsi, and they'll go to the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, and his response is, Ana Laha, this is mine. And he will make sajda before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Ya Muhammad, Raise your head and intercede and ask and you shall be given. 
Al-Hashir, Al-Aqib, the one who appears last in a procession. The Prophet ﷺ, as we read again in the shimmering light, that he is Al-Akhir, he is the last Prophet to come, but he is in reality Muqaddam. He is the greatest Prophet and takes precedent because he has the highest station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah saved the best for last. And this is not a claim we are making for the Prophet ﷺ. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Messenger ﷺ. So here's, here's an ayah that establishes this idea of prophecy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّ الَّذِينَ يَجِدُونَهُ مَتُوبًا عِنْدَهُ فِي تَوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Those who follow the messenger, the Nabi al-Ummi, there's different ways of interpreting this, and, and these uh, for translations or interpretations are not necessarily contradictory. They can all be true at the same time. That he is the unlettered prophet, that he is, uh, some say, the motherly prophet, the prophet of compassion, and Nabi al-Rahma, he said, I am the, the prophet of mercy. But also Gentile, as Edward Lane mentions in his famous lexicon, a Gentile prophet, meaning a non-Israelite prophet, whose description they find in their Torah, in, the home, in their Torah and Gospel. So this is the beginning of Surah Al-A'raf. Those to whom we gave the scripture beforehand, recognize him, recognition, ma'rifa means to recognize, right? To recognize him as they recognize their sons, those who fail themselves, they're the ones who disbelieve. In other words, his descriptions are given in their texts. So when he appeared on the scene, they can confirm his appearance and his character with their texts. But this is a famous hadith on the authority of Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu anhu, who is a Jewish scholar in Medina al Manawara. So he says that when the Messenger of God reached Medina, وسلم, the people rushed and it was said the Messenger of God has arrived. So I went out with the people to look at him. When I saw the face of the Messenger وسلم, he says, Araftu, I recognize that his face was not the face of a liar. And so the ulama say here that Ibn Salam, he just intuited the truthfulness from the face of the Prophet but in the context of Judaism, a prophet cannot have takdeeb, cannot lie, cannot have any type of untruthfulness. So he's actually saying here is, I recognize his face because it's described in my text and that his, his face is not the face of a liar, meaning that he's claiming to be prophecy. He's claiming to be a prophet, therefore his claim is true. And the first thing the Prophet وسلم, said, oh people uh, spread peace, Feed others, pray in the night while others are asleep, and you will enter paradise in peace. Sunan ibn Majah. And so they knew about him. And indeed, it, the Quran, is a revelation of the Lord of the worlds. Descending with it is the trustworthy spirit, which most take to be Jibril alayhi salam. Upon your heart, O Prophet وسلم, in order for you to be among those who warn Bidisan Arabi and Mubin in a form of Arabic that clarifies Awwaleen. And indeed, it the Quran or he, the Prophet وسلم, is foretold in the scriptures of old. Right? Is it not a sign for them? The pagan Arabs, this is a Meccan surah. Is it not a sign for these mushrikeen that the scholars of Bani Israel, the scholars of the Israelites, the rabbis, know this or know him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this verse is an interesting little insight into what's happening in the Meccan period. The Quran is not making this claim. The Quran is saying, is confirming something that the mushrikeen already knew, that rabbis, Jewish scholars, are confirming the nubuwa of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa well, this is a, this is one of my favorite hadith. <laughs> and Ibn Musa radiallahu anhu qala kana al-yahud yata'atrasuna inda al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Jews used to sneeze in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
يَرْجُونَ أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُمْ يَرْحُمُكُمُ اللَّهُ In hopes of him saying, because they believed he was a prophet, may Allah have mercy on you. فَيَقُولُوا يَهْدِكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيُسْلِحُ بَعْلَكُمْ But he would respond, may Allah guide you and correct your understandings. So this is in Genesis. This is something interesting. This is not the definitive prophecy, by the way. I'm still sort of setting the table here. So this is Genesis 17, 20, a famous verse where God is apparently speaking to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. And there's a sort of a, a play on words here, right? Shma'il shama'atika, right? It's sort of from the same root. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and will make him a great nation. Genesis 17, 20. The famous Spanish rabbi and Torah commentator, Bahia bin Asher, he quoted the 11th century rabbi, Hana el bin Hushia, who said, quote, once this prophecy came true, Islam conquered the civilized world like a whirlwind. We, the Jewish people, lost our position of preeminence in the world due to our sins. So they know that the Torah is describing the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and that the Muslims under the Prophet وسلم, have taken up the banner of Tawheed, which is called Yechiduth in Hebrew, in the world. Just a dash of gematria, okay? So this is a big thing in Judaism, um, the study of numbers, numerology, this type of thing. But in our tradition, we have to be careful about these things. That's why it's just a dash. You put a dash of salt on your food, right? Too much salt spoils the meal, right? So this is what the rabbis actually mentioned. This is not something I came up with, okay? The Hebrew uh, phrase, bim od ma'od, in Genesis 17:20, translated as exceedingly, has a numerical value of 92. So we go back to the previous slide, you see that? And we'll multiply him exceedingly. The phrase as a great nation, Magoi Gadol, which is at the very end, I will make him a great nation, also has a numerical value of 92. And then they say, the, for, for your information, the numerical value of the name Muhammad وسلم, in Hebrew, also has a numerical value of 92. Exceedingly multiplied, great nation, Muhammad This is not for me, this is from their scholars. More gematria, just the dash, don't be afraid. It's okay. <laughs> Brother, what is this? Is this? <laughs> Relax, just a little salt. This is what they mentioned. The value of the name Abram, the original name of Abraham, according to Genesis at least, Meaning exalted father is 243, while Hagar is 208, this total is 451, which is the exact numerical value of Ishmael or Ismail. Finally, we notice that Genesis 17 20 mentions that Ishmael, the son of Hagar, will beget 12 princes. Remarkably, Ismail is mentioned 12 times in the Quran, while Hagar, Hajira, is mentioned exactly 12 times in the Torah. Allahu Alam. Okay, now we're coming to the main course, inshallah. So a Sahabi paraphrases and summarizes a passage from the Hebrew Bible called Isaiah 42. So the following hadith is found in Imam al-Bukhari's Al-Adab al-Mufrad. Okay, book 12, number 9, is quoted in Kitab al-Shifa by Qadi Ayyad ibn Musa, rahimahullah, and Ata ibn Yasar qala laqeetu an uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As so Atayyah ibn Yasar met, said, I met Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, and I asked, tell me about the description of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in the Torah. And we should know the word Torah doesn't necessarily mean the first five books of Moses, but rather sacred Israelite tradition or teaching. The word Torah is a bit ambiguous. It just means instruction given to the Israelites. فَقَالَ أَجَلْ وَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَمَوْسُوفٌ فِي التَّوْرَةِ بِبَعْدِ صِفَتِهِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ شَاهِدًا وَمُفَشِّلًا وَنَذِيرًا So he said, yes, by Allah, he is described in the Torah, partly as he is described in the Qur'an. O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bringer of good news, and a warner, that's Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 45. 
وحرص للأميين أنت عبدي ورسولي سميتك المتوكل المتوكل ليس بفض ولا غليظ ولا سخابا في الأسواق So now he's paraphrasing and summarizing Isaiah 42 You are a refuge In other words the Prophet You are a refuge for the Gentiles You are my slave and my messenger I have called you the one on whom people rely One who is neither coarse nor vulgar and who shouts not in the markets. وَلَا يَدْفَعُ بِالسَّيْئَةِ السَّيْئَةِ وَلَكِنْ يَعْفُوا وَيَغْفِرُوا وَلَنْ يَقْبِدُهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى حَتَّى يُقِيمَ بِهِ مِلَّةَ عَوْجَاءَ بِأَنْ يَقُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ He does not repay evil with evil, but rather pardons and forgives. God will not take him back to himself until the crooked community has been straightened. Straightened out by him, and they say there is no God but Allah. <laughs> Through him, blind eyes, deaf ears, and covered hearts will be opened. Okay, so who is Isaiah? Sha'yahu, right? In Arabic, Sha'yahu. In Hebrew, Yasha'yahu. So Isaiah is listed by Imam Ibn Kathir, Imam At-Tabari, as one of the prophets and others. It's not definitive, but highly plausible. He's mentioned in the Dila'il al-Khayrat by Imam al-Jazuli. أَسْأَلُكَ اللَّهُمَّ بِالْأَسْمَاءِ الَّتِي دَعَاكَ بِهَا سَيِّرُنَا شَعْيَاءُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ This is Isaiah. I ask you, Allah, by the names in which our master Isaiah, peace be upon him, called you. So this is uh, a bit more sort of academic here, but just to mention this quickly, there's only two slides on this. The book of Isaiah is one of the 66 books of the Old Testament. The Tanakh, most Orthodox Jews and traditional Christians maintain that the historical prophet Yeshayahu ben Amutz, or Isaiah the son of Amutz, wrote the entire book in the 8th century BCE. The general historical consensus, however, is that the book of Isaiah was written by multiple authors across hundreds of years. It has three major divisions. We'll look at that. The oldest manuscript of Isaiah, complete manuscript, ever discovered is, is called the 1Q ISA. This is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in 1947. It's dated to about 100 BCE. So this is 700 years after the historical Yeshayahu alayhi salam. So that's a lot of time for this text to go through redaction. But even so, we'll look at the text. And here are the three divisions of the book of Isaiah. Proto, Deutero, Intrito, so Isaiah 42 is obviously in Deutero, Isaiah, uh, written around 550 or so BCE, written by an anonymous, anonymous Isianic prophet of some sort in Babylon, in Iraq, the ancient home of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the great iconoclast and quintessential monotheist. And it's no coincidence that the two major biblical prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam the greatest monotheists of all time are found in the two most emphatically monotheistic books in the entire Tanakh or Hebrew Bible, Deuteronomy 18 and Deutero Isaiah chapter 42. Okay, so now, this is the first verse, and the book of Isaiah is a bit long, it's 25 verses, I'm not going to go through all of them, inshallah, but uh, only about half of it, just to show you some highlights here. And Allahu Alam, so this is what was summarized and paraphrased by a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul is pleased. I put my spirit upon him. <clears throat> he will bring divine religion to the Gentiles. A few things to point out here. The word servant in Hebrew is ebed, which is the same word as abd. The word chosen one is bikhiri, which is related to muhtar. Uh, please, Ratsa is Radiya, so this Abd has God's Ridwan, Yabtabuna Fadla min Allahi, or Ridwana. And then my spirit, according to Jewish exegetes, refers to the spirit of prophecy. Ruhul Qudus, Qul Nazalahu Ruhul Qudus, Na Rabbika bil Haq. It's an ayah from the Quran. And then divine religion, which is Mishpat in Hebrew, uh, according to most scholars uh, of the Hebrew Bible. They mentioned, Jesenius, for example, mentions that the closest word in Arabic to Mishpat is Deen. Deen. He will bring Deen to the Ummiyin, to the Gentiles. 
He will not cry out nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. And of course, the hadith we read, wala sakhaban fil aswaq. The bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not put out. He will bring the true religion. The hadith we read, Laysa bi fuqdan wala ghabiyyubah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ As for the mercy of Allah that you have gentleness. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ قَلِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you were harsh or hard-hearted, you would have seen people flee from your presence. هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولُهُ بِالْهُدَى وَالدِّينِ الْحَقِ It's he who has sent his messenger with truth and the true religion. He shall not grow dim or be bruised until he has established the true religion on the earth. And the coastlands shall await his teaching. Almost all of the exegetes of this verse of Isaiah, they say that the coastlands are the countries that have coastlines on the Mediterranean Sea. So 21 countries that have coastlines, the dominant by far religious teachings practiced by these coastlands are the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu so this is clear fulfillment of prophecy. Some of these countries, Albania, Egypt, Palestine, Libya, Morocco, Syria, Turkey, Tunisia, etc. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I've called you, the, the Hebrew here is Qara'atika, from Qara'a, Iqara, Bismi Rabbika, Ladi Khalaq. And I've made you for a people's covenant, for a light to nations, or a light from the Gentiles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a covenant from all the prophets and the umam of those prophets that if this prophet sallallahu alayhi wa should come or arrive onto the scene, you must obey him and follow him. And of course, we have Nabi al Ummi, the Gentile prophet. The hadith says, Hirzan al Ummiyin, a refuge for the Gentile. And of course, a light to nations and the Prophet is called the light in the Quran. There is come unto you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a light, meaning the Prophet and a clarifying book. To open the eyes of the blind, to free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dungeons. According to the hadith, Muhammad. I am the Lord, that is my name, I will not give my glory to another, nor share my praise with carved idols. The, the verse in the So this Evid, this Abdullah, our excellence, this Mukhtar, right, this chosen one of God, he is going to come up against very strong idolatry. So some Christians, they say, most Christians, not all Christians, they say this is actually describing Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam was not sent to Mushrikeen. He was sent to Bani Israel. It's very clear here that this prophet is going to oppose mushrikeen. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and now a prophecy against some new things. Okay, and there's a verse from Baqarah, فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ مَا عَرَفُوا كَفَرُوا بِهِ فَذَانَوْتُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ So when something came that they should have recognized, they disbelieved in it. Right? And many of the ex exegetes here, the Mufassirin, they say, this is the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sing unto the Lord a new song in his praise from the ends of the earth. So a new song, song here, a new uh, scripture, you can say, a new praising of God. وَمِنْ قَبْلِهِ كِتَابُ مُوسَى إِمَامًا وَرَحْمًا وَهَذَا كِتَابٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِسَانًا عَرَبِيًّا لِيُنْذِرَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَبُشْرَ لِلْمُحْسِنِينَ and in the past was the book of Moses as a guide and a mercy. And this is a book that confirms in the Arabic language, okay, uh, in, in order to warn those who do wrong and give glad tidings to the people of good. The word praise here in Hebrew is tahilla, which is related to tahlil, which is to say la ilaha illallah. This I think is a very key verse. Let the desert and cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits, that the inhabitants of the stone, Salah, sing for joy, that can shout from the tops of the mountains. So Kedar, according to all biblical exegetes, refers to Arabs. Okay, Kedar is the second son of Ismail, according to the book of Genesis, according to Ibn Hisham, 
he says that the Prophet is a descendant of Ibrahim السلام, Ismail السلام, and then Qaydar, the son of Ishmael. The Qatarite Arab capital at the time of the Prophet وسلم, was Mecca. And then inhabitants of the stone, most biblical exegetes, they say, this is Petra in Jordan. Okay, and Petra was the capital of the Nabataeans, named after Navayoth, who was the firstborn son of Ismail السلام. So the Nabataean Arab capital is Petra, which is called Raqmu in ancient um, Nabataean, which means colored stone. But here's something interesting. So here's Mecca. Here's the capital of the Ketarites, next to that Petra, the capital of the uh, Nabataeans. But there's a mountain in Medina to Al-Manawra called Jabal Sala. And this is a picture of it. So this verse here could actually be a reference to Mecca and Medina. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man, like a man of war, he stirs up zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and prevail over his enemies. So this Evid, he's very gentle, but he's also a warrior, and he defends uh, himself and his ummah. He has that Jamal and Jalal. And I will leave the blind on the road they don't know, and paths which they do not know I will leave them. I will make darkness into light before them, and the crooked paths into straight ones. These things I will do, and I will not forsake them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the protector of those who have faith, he leads them from darkness into light. This is my path going straight, so follow it. And here the Sirat Mustaqim, according to Imam al-Razi, is the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Almost done here. And they shall turn back greatly ashamed of those who trust in graven images, who say to molten idols, you are our gods. So again, this prophet is coming into contact with mushrikeen, with idolaters. It's very clear. You deaf ones, listen. You blind ones, look and see. Again, the hadith, يَفْتَحُ بِهَا أَعْيُنًا عُمْيًا وَأَذَانًا سُمًّا So here, uh, the speaker who is God is chastising the Israelites for disbelieving in this prophet when he comes. And so these are kind of um, questions of uh, inkar. Will you really call my servant blind? Will you really call my messenger deaf? Will you really call the one who is my perfect servant blind? So interesting here, the word for perfect in Hebrew, mashullam, is an exact cognate to musallam, which means perfect, and also the one who is greeted often. So, in summary, Isaiah 42 predicts a divinely beloved servant of God, a servant who is God's chosen one and divinely inspired with God's spirit, a servant who is gentle in his disposition, yet formidable on the battlefield, exalted messenger of God, a prophet who will be a bulwark against idolatry, a champion of monotheism, a prophet whose law or teaching will convert the islands or the coastlands, a universal prophet who will be a light to or from the Gentiles, a prophet whose message will convert the Ketarites and Nabataeans, i.e. the Arabs, a prophet whose revelation will be a, quote, new song unto the Lord, a prophet who will bring true religion to the world, a prophet who is perfect and often greeted or praised. So I think it's very obvious. Now this is very interesting here. So these are two atheist scholars, but these are considered to be kind of top tier secular historians. Okay, so the guy at the bottom here is named Ehrman, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's written several books six New York Times bestsellers. And Ehrman says that Paul of Tarsus, who's a first century uh, persecutor of the early Christian movement, probably the founder of Christianity, he claimed to be the servant of Isaiah 42, the apostle to the nations, the light to the Gentiles, the final messenger in the culmination of God's plan. This is what he's saying now. Um, I've, I've been saying this for about 20 years, but 
don't get any credit for that. Anyway, uh, is Omer Ali here? Omer Ali, remember, San Jose State podcast. Anyway, <laughs> he's going to get the credit for this. Uh, and then according to Robert Eisenman, Paul was a Herodian, meaning he was an Arab Jew. That is, he had a Gentile background, right? So it's very interesting. Paul is claiming to be this person in Isaiah 42. Yet Paul taught that Jesus, peace be upon him, was a dying and rising savior, man-god, who died for our sins. This is blasphemy and idolatry according to standard normative Orthodox Judaism. Also, Paul did not convert the, con uh, the Arabs. Here are a couple of verses from Paul's own hand. I am saying all this especially for you Gentiles. God has appointed me as the apostle to the Gentiles. Nabi al-Ummi. He's claiming to be the Nabi al-Ummi. And interestingly here, Paul says in Galatians that when he had his experience of conversion, he did not go to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before me, like the leader of the early Christians. Instead, I went into Arabia. Why is he talking about Arabia? Because Isaiah 42 says that this great abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this great servant of Allah, this great prophet, he will convert to the Arabs. So here he is. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. O you who believe, uh, bless him and grant him peace. This is Musallam. This is the prophet that is often greeted. And you see throngs of humanity. This is going on around the clock greeting the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and more than humanity the malaika are sending salawat upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and more than that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khairan two minutes to spare thank you so much Jazakallah khairan does anyone have like a quick question or oh I have two minutes yes yeah, so... Could you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, it's about this slide here. So this verse 11, that let the desert and the cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits, clearly a reference to Arabs, let the inhabitants of the stone... The question is, what is the stone? That's the big question. There's difference of opinion. One, one opinion is, is the word is Sela in Hebrew. The original word is Sela, with an Ain, Sela. Uh, so the dominant opinion is that this is Petra. Petra means stone in Greek. Right? And it's actually a translation of Rachmu, which is ancient Nabataean, which means stone, colored stone. But, interestingly, there is a mountain in Medina to this day called Jabal Sela. Right now, there's a mountain in Medina. So, uh, the point was, this could be a reference to both Mecca and Medina, rather than Petra. Although Petra was the capital of the Nabataeans, right? So, a, a huge uh, capital of the Arabs. So both of these cities, right? And it's interesting, you look at Petra up here and Medina here, or sorry, and Mecca here, right? So the, so the capital of the Kedarites and the capital of Nabi. Right in the center, almost exactly, is Medina to Manawara. So like the Jews, they pick a, a, a place because the Prophet could come from one of these two places. So they settled right in the middle. That's a big question. What are all these Jewish tribes doing in Medina in the 7th century? The Arabs were there fighting these civil wars for decades is not a very good environment. It's not conducive to, the, to their uh, health. Uh, there was a fever in Medina or to their tohi. Why are they in Medina? I think I have to stop. Yes. Salam alaikum.